Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello. My name is Gabby and welcome. If you've never been here before, have no idea what I do here on my channel. I cover true crime cases and all the cases that I cover, more on the vintage side. They're all basically 20 years or older, so if that's something you might be interested in, maybe go down below and hit that subscribe button and join this little true crime family that I have here on my channel. We're all very open-minded and my comment section is just a positive place where everybody communicates and has a love for these cases. And make sure to hit that subscribe button before the new year because I have a lot of cases coming in 2021. It is so crazy to me that this is my last video of the year. We're going into 2021. I have a weird thing with odd numbered years, but nothing can be worse than 2020. So like, I'm okay with it. All of December, we were talking about John and Jane Doe cases. To end December, to end the year, I'm going to be talking about the Doe case that has been the most requested on my channel to cover. And that is Princess Doe. But before we get into the case of Princess Doe, today's video is sponsored and it is sponsored by one of my favorite companies that I've been working with this year, and that is Magellan TV. We know Magellan TV, documentary streaming service, over 3,000 documentaries. Magellan TV is dedicated to bringing all of its viewers the highest quality documentaries. If you're someone interested in expanding your overall knowledge of an array of topics, then Magellan TV is for you. From some of the best filmmakers, and networks from all around the world. Magellan TV is also adding new content every week. You'll never run out of things to watch, and it can be watched anytime and anywhere. It's compatible with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, and iOS. There's also no ads, so your content will never be interrupted. Out of personal opinion, their crime and mystery section is the best. My recommendation on Magellan TV this month has to be Night Terrors. Night Terrors tells of the insensitive and spine-chilling murder of South African up-and-coming actor Brett Golden and his friend Richard Bloom, who was a fashion designer. Talented young men who were hijacked and shot execution style in April of 2006. If you want to try Magellan TV yourself, get a little free trial, you can go to try.magellantv.com slash gabulosis. Thank you Magellan TV for sponsoring yet again another one of my videos. And now let's get into the case. This is the case of Princess Doe. This story starts off in Blairstown, Warren County, New Jersey. Blairstown is a small rural community that during the 1980s had a population less than 5,000. It was mostly farmland and open fields. Right off of State Route 94 lay a cemetery named Cedar Ridge Cemetery. In today's time, it is across the street from a tractor supply store, but back in the early 80s, it was across the street from an A&P shopping plaza. This cemetery is one of the most well-known ones in Blairstown, and in this cemetery on July 15th of 1982, a discovery would be made that would change the town forever. On this day, a cemetery maintenance worker named George Keis was digging a grave when he noticed something strange off in the distance. He went to get a closer look and discovered the body of a female teenager over the steep bank that leads to a creek below called the Jacksonburg Creek. She was found lying on her back. Here's a map of the cemetery thanks to princessdoe.org. The A marks the spot where her body was located. Since the cemetery has been expanded and redone over the years, it is hard to pinpoint the exact location she was found, but she was found somewhere within this circle. The smaller circle above, marked as B, shows the area where her body would eventually be buried. The girl's identity was unknown. She had no identification on her. She was another Jane Doe. George Kais phoned Lieutenant Eric Kantz of the Blairstown Police at about 8.20 in the morning, right after he made the gruesome discovery. After the news regarding the finding of this girl started spreading around the area, people were absolutely terrified because it was actually the third murder in a 15-month period in the area. Parents started worrying more about their children, making sure they came home before dark, and everyone started keeping a better lookout for anyone in the area who was suspicious. 
They immediately compared her fingerprints against millions of sets of fingerprints the FBI had on file, but no matches could be made. There is a lot that we do not know about the girl, but we're going to go over some of the things we do. She was estimated to be between the ages of 14 to 18. It was hard to determine a close age range because her body had been exposed to the heat during the summer month of July, which based on weather records from the area, it had been in the mid to high 80s during the hottest part of the day. Also due to the weather, it was hard to determine how long she had been out there, but it was originally guessed to be between a few days up to three weeks. She was Caucasian and had medium brown shoulder length hair. The poor girl's face was beaten beyond recognition, so finding out an exact eye color was nearly impossible, and the object used to bludgeon her face has never been determined. Her death was ruled a homicide. She weighed about 110 pounds and stood at about 5 feet 2 inches tall. Both of her ears were pierced and her left ear was pierced twice. She had nail polish on her fingernails but only on the right hand. She was discovered wearing a red short sleeve shirt and her peasant skirt was laying on top of her legs. The skirt had peacocks on it. She was not wearing any shoes or any underwear or bra. Based on the look of the scene, it seems she may have been sexually assaulted, but it was difficult to determine 100% due to, again, the exposure of the body. A 14 karat gold cross necklace with an ornate design was also found tangled in the victim's hair. She had no known scars, tattoos, or birthmarks. It was unknown if there were any scars or birthmarks on her face, though, due to the condition it was in. Her two top front teeth appeared to be a bit of a gray shade. According to the Doe Network, her teeth were in decent shape, but a few dental fillings were present, and she was wearing blue eyeshadow. The victim's appendix and tonsils were intact, and she was not pregnant at the time of her death and never had been before. The toxicology report stated that no traces of drugs or alcohol were found in her system, but due to the lapse in time between her death and being found, it is unknown if there had been at the time her life was taken. Her two front teeth being a little bit gray may be something that pops out at you as being odd information. I did a little bit of research into it, and one interesting thing that I found was tetracycline. According to Crest.com, chances are anyone you've met with gray teeth was most likely born before the 1980s and may have been given a powerful antibiotic called tetracycline at an early age. Tetracycline is an antibiotic medication designed to fight bacterial infections in your body, such as urinary tract infections, acne, and other infections that has been proven to cause tooth discoloration. Other causes for gray teeth may be bruising, some sort of trauma to the tooth, possibly decay, or even silver fillings may cause the tooth to go a little bit gray. So that kind of explains that. Someone took this girl's life though, and due to the wounds on her arms and hands, this girl was a fighter. She definitely fought back and tried to save herself from her attacker. At the very beginning of this case, a woman whose daughter was missing claimed that the necklace of the victims looked very much like her daughter's. She was positive of it. Authorities thought they may have found who their Jane Doe was. The woman even fainted because she was so sure the victim was her daughter. After comparing dental records of the Jane Doe and the woman's missing daughter, though, it wasn't a match. Thankfully, though, her daughter would eventually be found alive. Lieutenant Krantz had a feeling this girl would be a Jane Doe for a while, and he didn't want her to be just another one. He thought that the unknown girl needed a special name. He gave her the name Princess, and she would be known as Princess Doe. He said she was probably someone's princess at some time during her life, and the name was appropriate. Because of the time lapse between Princess Doe's murder and her body being found, however long that was, they did not know if the location where her body was found was the location where her life was taken or if she was killed and then placed there later on. Like we know, one of the first things police started doing was running the story in the local newspaper. A registered nurse named Anne Latimer was working when she overheard the doctor talking about a story in the newspaper. He sarcastically stated how appropriate it was that a lifeless body was located in a cemetery. 
The registered nurse didn't pay much attention to what he was saying, but later when she got home and pulled her own newspaper out of the mailbox and saw the victim's clothing on the front page, it triggered a memory. She went to police and stated that she recognized the clothing on the victim, that she and her six-year-old daughter saw the woman at the A&P supermarket across the street from the cemetery at about 11.30 a.m., two days before the body was found. She said the girl had her hair in a bun and had a very plain facial expression on her face. She remembered the girl because her daughter asked if there were eagles on the girl's skirt and Anne informed her daughter that they were peacocks. Anne said that she loved the girl's skirt and asked her where she got it. The girl didn't answer, looked away, and walked off. If Anne Latimer really did see the girl at the supermarket two days before her body was found, then that means her body was there in that spot a couple of days, a lot less than they originally guessed in the 80s, and goes along more with today's guess of how long they think her body had been in the cemetery for. Lieutenant Kranz immediately headed to the AMP supermarket to see what he could find out. He said, I checked if there were any cards used. I went through that thing upside down and checked it. I was in every catch basin, in every garbage pail and dumpster, didn't miss one. Nothing much came from his search of the store. Later on though, at least three individuals came forward saying they recognized her clothing, not from seeing her in person though, but from where it came from. They claimed that they remembered the clothing from a now closed store in Long Island, New York, an area over a hundred miles east of Blairstown. The label on the shirt was gone, but they did determine her skirt was manufactured in the Midwest of the United States of America, but they never proved for sure if the clothing came from the store in Long Island. They know that the place the skirt was manufactured had sent those skirts all over the United States to different clothing stores. Again, a dead end. Time passed, but there were rarely any updates in the case. No new information was really coming forward. The case was at a standstill. And on January 22nd, 1983, about five months after the discovery of the girl's body, they decided to give her a proper burial at the same cemetery she was found in and her grave would be dug by the same man who discovered her body, George Kais. People in the area who cared for her case helped donate money for her plot and gravestone a gravestone that read, Princess Doe, missing from home, dead among strangers, remembered by all. Born, question mark, found July 15th, 1982. She was finally at rest, but the case wasn't. The case definitely was at a standstill when it came to actual evidence, but through the years, many theories arose as to who she may have been and who may have been responsible for her murder. I have to say that there are tons of theories in the case of Princess Doe. Before DNA testing, there was one main theory, and that was that Princess Doe was a teenager named Diane Dye. Dye was a 13-year-old girl who vanished from San Jose, California on July 30th, 1979. July of 1979 was three years before Princess Doe was found but there had been many supposed sightings of Diane in the few years after she vanished, and she was five feet, two inches tall and weighed 110 pounds, just like Princess Doe. Even though there were blatant differences in the dental records of Diane Dye and Princess Doe, many, even police officers, thought that they could be the same individual, even despite the long distance between California and New Jersey. DNA testing, though, would prove that theory to be false and that Diane Dye and Princess Doe were two separate people after they compared Diane Dye's sister's DNA against Princess Doe's DNA in the year 2003. So that was one main theory in this case that was completely ruled out. But there is another main theory, not about who she was, but about who may have been responsible. That is a theory that the people responsible were a married couple named Arthur and Donna Kinlaw. So we've gotten to Arthur and Donna Kinlaw. Are you guys ready for this one? Because I had a bit of a migraine while researching into them. Well, Arthur Kinlaw ran a prostitution ring in Hunts Point, which is a neighborhood in the Bronx, New York. Arthur ran this ring and Donna basically helped him. 
In the month of June during the year 1998, Arthur and Donna Kinlaw would be arrested after Donna was forging the name of a woman who had been a part of Arthur's prostitution ring. Police tracked down the woman, whose name was Elena. Elena had a lot to say about the couple and ended up telling authorities that Arthur, with the help from his wife Donna, had drugged, strangled, and beat a woman that Elena had only known as Linda. Linda was a teenager that Arthur had met at a reggae bar in April of 1984. Linda was, of course, a false name that she used. You're probably like, okay, that's 1984. How does this correlate with Princess Doe? We're getting to that, I promise. According to a story ran in Newsday, which is a NYC news source, Elena described the murder of Linda in detail, that Arthur had taken Linda's life because she didn't want to be in this ring of prostitution anymore. He beat her with an aluminum baseball bat, wrapped her in a shower curtain, and dumped her in the East River. Her decomposed body had washed up weeks later. Linda was not her real name, and she is still unidentified to this day. We don't know much about her, but they did finally know how her life ended and who was responsible. Arthur would even admit to it in court in the year 2000, going into detail about what happened. So at this point, we know Arthur took Linda's life with the help of Donna. Donna was nervous and wanted to prevent herself from receiving life in prison. She ratted on her husband and told authorities that he killed three other women, one of those being Princess Doe. Donna said Arthur came home with a girl that was around 18 years old, that they had spent some time with her and the girl was one of the girls in his ring. She said then that one night he left with her and came back without her. That after he came back alone, he cleaned his car and got rid of the clothing he was wearing. Donna thought it was strange but didn't think much of it considering women came and went. She claimed that he then, weeks later during an argument, admitted he killed the girl. Donna said that he threatened her saying that she'd end up dead just like the girl. This is the police sketch of the girl based off of what Donna said she looked like. Arthur actually admitted to the killing to authorities. He said he did kill Princess Doe and that she was in fact one of the women in his ring. He also told authorities though that Donna left out a very crucial part of the story, that she didn't see him come home without the girl, that Donna was actually there in the cemetery when he took the girl's life that she witnessed the entire thing. He told all this to the person who was in charge of Princess Doe's case at the time, which was Detective Lieutenant Steven Spears. Steven Spears took over the case after Kranz in 1998. In today's time, he is now retired as well. Arthur was convicted on two counts of second degree murder. He received 20 years to life. Donna, on the other hand, was convicted of manslaughter and got out in 2003. Neither Arthur nor Donna were able to provide a name for the Jane Doe though, not even a false one that she used. According to JacquelineGallucci.com, Lieutenant Steven Spears was quoted saying, let's put it this way. I can't use the word confession. He made some admissions. I'll put it in these terms. He claimed responsibility for her death, but I have no physical evidence to confirm that and without the identity of Princess Doe, I have no way of connecting the dots, so to speak, putting her in a place where he could have been or would have been at the same time. That's the unfortunate thing right now. The key thing is to identify her. If we could identify her, then I can try to verify the information Arthur Kinlaw provided. So in other words, based on actual evidence and not knowing Princess Doe's identity, he cannot deny Arthur Kinlaw's claim. He also cannot verify it as factual. Neither have, as of right now, been convicted when it comes to Princess Doe's murder. He goes on to say, there are other theories, but again, I can't base my facts on theories. I have to base my theories on facts. And I have really no strong facts that appear to say the Kinlaws are involved or not involved. It's an open door. And there have been other persons of interest prior to that. And there have been persons of interest since then. 
Again, I go back to that, unfortunately, we have no way of substantiating any of this information because no one is providing a name or identity. We don't know who she is. At this point, there is no physical evidence to tie any of these people in to this crime. There were other killers that people thought may have been responsible, such as Henry Lee Lucas. We discussed Henry Lee Lucas in a previous Doe video this month. There has been no solid connection between him and Princess Doe ever made, and even if he ever said he took her life, who knows, because he would have literally taken credit for Julius Caesar's murder if he could have. He was a pathological liar who literally just wanted credit for killing everyone. Anyways, back in 1999, when DNA testing was still in its younger years, that's when they exhumed Princess Doe's body to gather DNA. This would be how they ended up comparing her DNA to the DNA of Diane Dye's sister. After collecting that DNA, they did rebury her in the same location, respectively. Some missing people that have been ruled out as being Princess Doe are Barbara Louise Cotton, Brenda Cecilia Crowley, Maria Florence Andres, Beverly Elaine Darnell, Eva Gerline De Brule, Charlotte June Kinsey, Cinda Leanne Pallet, Dean Marie Peters, and Alma Violet Root. They have really done all they can do with today's technology to try to identify Princess Doe. They have ran her fingerprints through the FBI databases many times. They have looked through tens of thousands of missing persons reports. They have compared DNA to family members of missing people. They have many composite sketches done. They have followed pretty much every lead in this case. The two main people who were in charge of the case at different times were Lieutenant Krantz and Lieutenant Spears, and both of them think that she was a drifter, someone not from the area who maybe moved around a lot. Maybe she was a runaway. Evidence to further push this theory was isotopic testing of her hair and a tooth. They did the testing in 2012, and it showed that she was born in the United States of America. Her hair showed that she had spent at least seven months to 10 months in either the Midwestern or Northeastern part of the country. The tooth sample showed she may have been from Arizona. So here's the exciting part. Here's the information where we might have a breakthrough in this case very soon. Right now, in today's time, as of November of this year, her body has been re-exhumed and they are currently trying to extract even more DNA of hers so they can have a better DNA sample to put into a database for genetic genealogy. So they can ultimately see if her DNA matches anyone's DNA on a genealogy website. Most often they use the DNA Doe Project, a nonprofit organization that helps identify Jane and John Doe's and enter it into the genealogy website, GEDmatch. Basically, we just have to sit and wait and see if any further updates in this case are going to happen because even though the case is 38 years old, they're still trying and they're asking anyone with any information about the case of Princess Doe to please come forward. If you yourself have any information about the identity of Princess Doe or any information regarding her case at all, you are urged to call the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children Cyber Tip Line at 1-800-843-5678 or the Warren County Prosecutor's Office Major Crimes Unit at 908-475-6275. Remember that you can stay anonymous. There are still quite a few possible matches for Princess Doe, but if you have another one you want to submit, you can submit it to tips at princessdoe.org. Most valid matches will be added to the main list within 72 hours. You can find the list of current possible matches at princessdoe.org slash matches.html. Most people who work on the case of Princess Doe in today's time do have basically the same opinion as to where she may have come from. A lot of people do think that she may have been from Long Island and maybe she was a teenager who ran away from home or maybe possibly she was 18 years old or older and that she just left home, left her area and wanted to start anew. There are so many people that still care about this case and honestly, 
I'm one of them as well. I did not know much about the case of Princess Doe beforehand. I had gotten so many requests to cover her case and I was like, okay, obviously it has to be a good case. And I remember I had watched maybe one or two videos regarding the case, but it wasn't a case that I really dove too much into until I did start my research. It is very heartwarming how many people truly care about this girl who was found in a cemetery in Blairstown, New Jersey, a place that not many people have heard of. And so many people have come together to keep her memory alive, a girl who nobody really knows the backstory of. The story of Princess Doe shows how incredible people can be. There have been so many memorial services held for her through the years, but something that happened in April of this year also shows how horrible people can be because in April of 2020, her grave was vandalized. According to the New Jersey Herald, one of the founders of the Blairstown Museum said, we hope the perpetrators are caught, but we are not sure if anything will come of this except an important reminder to the public that we must respect the final resting place of those who have passed. For Princess Doe, this is just another tragic twist in the story of a young, unidentified homicide victim. Her identity may never be discovered, her full story never told, her murderer never found, but she was still someone's daughter and she deserves to rest in peace. Some people do think that the person who vandalized her grave or the people responsible know something about what happened. Maybe they know her backstory. Maybe they know who she really was. They were the people responsible. They went to her grave and they trashed it. We don't know, but as a whole, most people do think that it was just a random act of violence, that it was just somebody who knew the story from the area and just wanted to cause an uproar. Either way, it's absolutely disgusting and I really hope that they find the people responsible because I tried to look up and see if there were any updates, but as I know of right now, they have not found the person or the people responsible for vandalizing Princess Doe's grave. That is one very sad part of this case in recent time, but the most exciting part has to do with the fact that they re-exhumed her body. Her case could have a huge update very soon because of how many success stories we have had in just the last year and just the last two years when it comes to the Doe Network and putting in John and Jane Doe's DNA into GEDmatch. The chances of her being identified are higher now than ever before. So many Jane and John Doe's identities have been discovered in just the last year, like I said, such as Precious Jane Doe, Valentine Jane Doe, Huntington Beach Jane Doe, and two we discussed just this month, Delta Dawn and Barron County John Doe. Could her identity be discovered in 2021? We will just have to wait and see. So that is the case of Princess Doe. That is my last video for 2020, and I hope that sometime in the year of 2021, I can do an update video about this case, telling that she has finally been identified. That would be incredible. Let me know your thoughts when it comes to the case of Princess Doe down below in the comments. And also my very first video of 2021 is going to be an updated Q&A video. So if you have any questions for me at all, true crime related, not true crime related, anything, leave those down below in the comments as well. Everybody have an exciting and safe New Year's Eve and New Year's and I will see you all in 2021. Bye guys.